Hi, I'm Jay. I run Blue Sky, and we are a company building a decentralized social protocol that uses IPLD. You've probably heard of us in association with Twitter since we started out as a project there, but let me give you some brief background to catch you up on who we are, how we started. So in 2019, Jack Dorsey, who was Twitter's CEO at the time, announced that they'd be funding a decentralized social protocol. In his initial tweet, he listed four reasons for why Twitter would be funding this project. One of them is that centralized moderation isn't gonna scale over the long run. His second point is that social media is increasingly about curation, and users and developers don't get enough freedom in the current environment where algorithms are proprietary. Another is that the incentives of social platforms push towards promoting content that generates outrage, and this doesn't seem very healthy for society. And then another point, which is basically just an observation about the state of the ecosystem, which is that new decentralized technologies make it seem possible to rebuild Twitter as a protocol in a way that didn't seem possible 10 years ago. So I agree with most of these reasons, and I also think that decentralizing social at a technical level doesn't by itself necessarily solve all these problems. But it distributes power over the network, and it allows many more entities beyond one company to build solutions, and many more communities beyond the community of one company to self-govern their part of the network. So I think that this is really the right approach to start solving these problems at the higher levels. So in 2020, Twitter brought together some outside collaborators in a matrix chat room, including myself, to discuss the problem space. I wrote up an ecosystem review that compared existing decentralized social networks. And in 2021, Twitter chose me as the project lead, so I set up an independent company to build out the vision for Blue Sky I'd proposed. I did not want to be a part of Twitter at the time because I figured a lot of things could change, and even though Twitter was you know, wanting to really work closely with Blue Sky at the time, who knows what could happen in the future? And I'm really glad I did that because now Elon is not my boss. <laughs> and whatever changes Elon makes, I hope people start recognizing that it's a pretty vulnerable position when democracy depends on discourse happening on social platforms that can be so quickly changed. Centralization is a structure that lends itself to rapid change, and that change can be for good or bad. And now that we know the basics of how social media works, I think it might be healthier to turn it into a more stable, neutral infrastructure layer for public conversations. So in 2022, I received some funding, and then I hired a team. And so this is our current dev team. We have three developers on the team. Uh, we have a range of experience across decentralized social protocols and traditional web services, and could use a few more developers, like a mobile dev, front-end UX engineer, always looking for a good protocol engineer, so get in touch if you want to join. We also have some great technical advisors like Jeremy Johnson, first engineer at Protocol Labs who helped build IPFS, and Martin Kleppman, the author of Designing Data Intensive Applications, who's done a lot of research on distributed data structures. So with this team on board, we did some more research and settled on a technical architecture this year. And we had four major design questions. How do we make the system usable, scalable, portable, and accountable to its users? We want it to be as scalable as mainstream social applications, so users, uh, sorry, as usable as mainstream social applications and scalable, so that users don't have to like, learn too many new things. Like, you know, the problems they were just talking about with key management, I just don't expect most users to want to figure this out. We also want it to be as scalable, so you can have billions of users without running into performance limitations that require you to be doing novel R&D on the fly to try to overcome. And so these considerations suggested that we'll need some traditional service providers, like hosting services. But if there are entities in the network like this, we want user data to be easily portable between them so users don't get locked in. And for any entity that ends up with power in the network, we want mechanisms that help keep them accountable to the users. And so this can include tools for transparency into their actions or just the right tools for users to exit. So the three main architectures for decentralized social networks that we looked at are federated, peer-to-peer, -peer, and blockchains. Federated networks have a familiar client-to-server architecture. The servers just talk to each other. Peer-to-peer -peer applications distribute network functionality across many peers. And blockchains are global data structures that are logically centralized, but politically decentralized. And so this makes them useful in cases where you need global consensus, but your system is decentralized. But it's still an expensive way to get that. And if you're not trying to put all the data in your network on a blockchain, which I don't think you need to, you still need to choose architecture for the rest of your network. And you can put data from a federated network on a blockchain, or you can use blockchains as a global database for some use cases in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So we decided to make our design blockchain agnostic. The protocol doesn't need a blockchain, but if you wanted to, say, like register a user ID on a blockchain, we accept decentralized identifiers so the system could become compatible with doing that. When comparing federation and peer-to-peer, Federated networks are very usable and scalable in familiar ways for users and developers. 
You have a username at a domain, like alice at bluesky.app. The problem is you can get locked into the site you sign up at. So if you sign up to bluesky.app, it's kind of hard to move. Even if the network tries to help you move, like by doing a redirect, the user server still has to be willing to help with that redirect. So if someone looks up alice at bsky.app, bsky.app has to say, alice moved to foo.com, go over there. But what if bsky.app unexpectedly disappears? Alice is out of luck. The user's lost their identity and their data and has to just go over from scratch and start over somewhere else. Because it's hard to leave and because there's very little transparency into what a server is doing with your data, there's not much accountability for servers in a federated network. So if centralized platforms are governed like monarchies, Federated networks are governed like little feudal societies. There isn't just one king ruling over the whole network, but there are smaller lords who still have absolute power over their domain. To mitigate these downsides of federated networks, we borrowed some properties from peer-to-peer -peer networks, mainly cryptographic IDs, so keys, and content addressing hashes. We call these properties self-authenticating, meaning the identity or data can be independently verified without a server, although you can have one for convenience. Self-authenticating authenticating components, they don't need to be exclusive to peer-to-peer -peer networks, but peer-to-peer -peer networks use them because they don't have servers to act as authenticating authorities. Another possible component of self-authenticating protocols is verifiable computation, so like zero-knowledge proofs. These proofs can add transparency and verifiability to computation that's been performed, and there's a lot of new use cases this could unlock, but it's outside the scope of our current design because it's new and complex, so not going to get into it. Peer-to-peer -peer social networks like, for example, Secure Scuttlebutt, if you've heard of that, use cryptographic IDs for user identities. This means that instead of your base ID being like alice at bsky.app, it would be this long string of characters representing your public key. You can give this key a nickname like alice, but there's nothing unique about that nickname, and you can't find the user by it. To find people in the network at all, you usually have to introduce some kind of super node that has more visibility and connections. SSB calls these nodes pubs. I don't think it's a bad thing, but it's just something we've observed, which is that even if you try to keep your peer-to-peer -peer network really flat, centralization tends to emerge when you start optimizing for convenience and usability. IPFS uses content addressing to find data by hash rather than by location in the network. So instead of needing to know where something or someone is located, you can just look them up in this distributed hash table. But to use this in a web app, you usually need a gateway, which is another example of reintroducing this element of centralization when you try to make things really usable and convenient. So given that peer-to-peer -peer networks have these really cool self-authenticating properties, but tend to end up reintroducing centralization for convenience, we decided why not just start off by assuming servers are gonna do the heavy lifting to create a good user experience. So our architecture combines servers, cryptographic keys, and content addressing. The first draft of the protocol we put out was called ADX, or the Authenticated Data Experiment, which we released on GitHub earlier this year. And now it's called the AT Protocol, or Authenticated Transfer Protocol. It's maturing, but it's still not done, so if you go look at the specs, you're gonna find some to-dos. But I can talk about the overall structure here. So the ad protocol has three main components, as well as a schema system, which I won't get into, but is an approach that optimizes for compatibility between different implementations. The network architecture is federated, so there's clients and servers. The base identifier is a DID, or decentralized identifier, and that connects a human-readable name like alice.com with a public key. The did method we're currently using, did PLC, is really just a placeholder until something better comes along, but structurally we think this is probably the right approach. User data is stored in repos, which are analogous to Git repositories, and it's these repos that use IPLD to content address every record. So Git and GitHub are a good analogy for how this is gonna work. Imagine if your social account was hosted in a Git repository, and you could use a site like GitHub, but you could also easily move to an alternative like GitLab or Bitbucket. This is the relationship between the user repos and the servers that we call PDSs, or personal data servers. The IPLD codec we're using is js dag -Cibor. It's working pretty well for us. And the cool thing about the IPFS ecosystem is it already has tooling for working with Merkle DAGs. So you'll be able to export your social data as a car file right from the start and play around with it. The specific kind of Merkle tree we're using is a Merkle search tree. And the nice property is that trees are always probabilistically balanced. So to wrap it up, here's a high-level overview of the app protocol network. You have users with a human-readable username, as well as a key, and it's linked through a DID. The user keys are currently on the server, but that's just because we didn't want to get into client-side key management right now, because we weren't super confident we could create a really smooth user experience for that piece. It's possible to do, though, and that's something that we'll definitely pursue in the future. 
The servers federate with each other, and to get a global view into the network and do things like search a trending hashtag or receive curated feeds, there's these aggregators that index content across the network. And this is sort of the basics of how we envision this network working. You can check out the current state of the specs on atproto.com, and the code is on GitHub. To put it all together, we're building a client app called Blue Sky on top of the at protocol layer. I haven't talked about some of the things Jack mentioned in his original tweet, like moderation, curation, and communities, because these are really application level experiences that we're still working on. But this year was about laying the infrastructure and making sure that the stuff that we do build is going to be built on a very strong base layer of portability. We announced a waitlist for a private beta last week, and we got over 60,000 users, which is a lot more than we were expecting for a test group. So if you want to get in early and you're willing to give some user experience feedback, the best way to do that right now is probably just to DM me on Twitter. We'll see how well this scales. And also, we're hiring. We could use a mobile dev to help out with the app, a front-end UX developer to help us prototype these approaches to moderation, reputation, curation that we're taking, and a systems or protocol engineer to work on the app protocol. So if you'd like to join us, reach out. And these are the relevant websites. If you go there, you'll find links to like the Matrix Dev Room, the jobs, everything else. So thank you.